Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, this is, uh, what is it, third week, I think, we've talked about this wonderful subject. Um, and the uh, first week, uh, I kind of introduced it, looked a little bit at what Scripture says about it in a general way, and uh, I introduced this kind of this working definition, if you will, of anger, um, which basically is this. Uh, and, and we're going to keep coming back to this because we're going to keep talking about it in the different weeks. Um, our anger is our whole personed active response of negative moral judgment against perceived evil. And we'll break that down as the, as, as the weeks go on. Um, last week, uh, John looked at the difference between righteous anger and sinful anger. Um, oh, I hate these things. <laughs> and we saw that righteous anger um, does some different things. First of all, it reacts against actual sin not just perceived sin, but actual sin, as defined in the Bible. Um, it focuses on God and on his concerns, not on me and my concerns. Um, and also, if it's a righteous anger, it's going to coexist with other godly qualities, and it's going to be expressed in godly ways, not in ungodly ways. Um, so that's kind of the main thing from last week. So this week, we're going to look at something different. Um, it's, uh, we're going to talk about what is at the center, the core the heart of anger, if you will. Um, and let's see, you know what? I'll just read it real quick. Like you and me, Jack and Jill, back to Jack and Jill, uh, the uh, problem marriage, they have an anger problem. Jack blows up, Jill clams up. He rants and raves, she simmers and stews. It's Thursday. Jack returns at 6.30 from a pressured work day, eager to joy, enjoy a tasty meal and a relaxing evening with his family. Unfortunately, the house is cluttered and the kids are wild. It's probably partly your fault, Jack. Uh, summer isn't ready. It's not even started. All I want to do is come home to a peaceful house, he yells to Jill. Is that too much to ask? This place is a mess. He then compounds the problem by asking that proverbially provocative question that no right-minded spouse should ever ask. Just what have you been doing all day around here? Jill is also angry, but she doesn't yell back, at least uh, this time. Her anger is more icy blue than red hot. Jill resents Jack's criticism, his yelling, and his lack of tenderness. In turn, she withdraws. She retreats dutifully into the kitchen, licking her wounds, feeling alone and defeated. She mutters to herself her common chorus, If only I had a husband who would accept me as I am. I need to be loved unconditionally, not attacked all the time. Supper, she murmurs. I'd like to dump this hot pasta right over his head. Um, sadly... <laughs> That's a scenario that's probably played out in some of our homes. Um, uh, I don't know if I've ever asked Kay, what the heck were you doing all day? But I've thought it, uh, and it's come across in my tone, uh, and we've lived that scenario similar to it out a few times. So how do we solve this? Uh, how, how do we solve this anger that, that, that we get caught up in? Um, and the short answer is, like I said in the first week, we got to find the roots. We got to find the roots. It's my dumb Blackberry story. You got to pull it up by the roots. The roots are the cause. We have to identify what the roots are, and then we got to pull them out. Okay, that's the that's the short answer. So we've got to flesh that out, though. Um, so I want to look at what the cause of anger is. What 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 are the roots? And I guess first I want to start at maybe what the roots aren't, because the culture that we live in has a lot of ideas about what this is. What's the root of anger? Where does anger come from? And it's got all kinds of theories about the cause. Um, you know, you read Freud or some of these guys, you know, it's, it's these inner unconscious uh, psychodynamic forces that are at work here. You know, you got the ego and the id and all these things that you don't even really understand. Um, and it just, it's kind of not really in your control. Um, a lot of people point to things like childhood trauma. Um, uh, maybe you had a just uh, difficult circumstances when you were a child. Maybe your parents just really stunk at parenting. Um, you just had real bad modeling, bad parenting. You got beat up, you were molested, you were neglected, um, things like that. Another thing that people will point to is suffering, things that are going on right now um, that create anger in our lives. Um, you know, maybe you lost a job. Uh, maybe you're stuck in a lousy financial situation. You're, you're poor, you're in poverty. Uh, sickness, uh, some, you know, disability of some kind um, has, has struck. Um, and that creates anger. Um, another real common one is unmet emotional needs. You know, you live with somebody who doesn't appreciate you. Or maybe worse than that, they're downright mean to you um, all the time. Um, that creates anger. Uh, physiological things, uh, fatigue. Um, you know, it's, a t it's that time of the month, your, your hormones, uh, some kind of disability, illness that, that can strike. You know, all these physiological type things. Um, 
And then not so much at the culture of the world, but in, in a lot of the culture of the church, a lot of people point to uh, Satan. He's, it's, it's his fault. You know, the, the <laughs> how many of you remember Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. <laughs> um, there's that idea that uh, satanic attacks, you got a, a demon of anger um, or demon possession or, you know, demon oppression, um, that there's this demonic activity that's responsible for our anger. Um, obviously, a lot of these things, they can happen, and a lot of them do happen. Um, except for possession, if you're a Christian. That doesn't happen. <laughs> That's a whole other subject, a whole other message, which I've actually taught on, but I'm not going to do that tonight. Um, I'm also not real sold on the whole demon of anger thing. <laughs> um, seems to me anger is a work of the flesh, not... A, not the name of a demon, but that's a whole other message as well. Um, but these things do exist, a lot of them, and they do make it difficult to avoid an angry response. Okay, grant it. I, I grant that. Um, but that's a far cry from being a cause or a root of anger. They may be a, a source of provocation, um, an occasion to get angry, but it's, that's a lot different than being the cause or, or the root. Um, a, a provocation is not a cause. Uh, you know, the... Uh, dumb example, but the ridiculous traffic that I encounter every time I try to drive to Seattle, which is less and less by design, um, that traffic is not the cause for the frustration, my favorite way of describing anger, <laughs> the anger that I feel a lot of times when I drive. That, that you know, it's like, I'll, I'll be with Ken, this traffic drives me crazy. The traffic doesn't drive me anything. Um, the traffic doesn't make me crazy. It's, it's, it's me. Um, uh, that, you know, the fact that, uh, <laughs> this is not a personal example, the fact that my boss may be a jerk, okay, no, <laughs> not a personal example, um, uh, that's not something, you know, a lot of you, I know, have had to deal with that, because I've talked to, to people that have to deal with that, um, and that does not make me angry, that may be an occasion to anger, but, uh, you know, the fact that I, I, I don't have enough money, you know, to, to get what I want, or, you know, my car's always breaking down, or, my kids are always screwing up. You know, whatever. These, don't, these aren't things that, that are causes of my anger. They're occasions to get angry. Um, uh, the flip side of the, of the gender, you know, again, you, you know, your hormones <laughs> may make it hard to deal with the fact that you're married to a selfish jerk of a husband, but that is not the cause of your anger. Um, you, you, can't, you can't blame that. It doesn't make you angry or bitter. We're not, uh, we're not programmed machines, is what I'm saying, I guess, that just respond, you know, garbage in, garbage out. That's not us. We're made in the image of God. Um, we're image bearers. We're active moral responders. It's in that definition. It's an, it's an active response. It's a whole person response. It's not just a mechanistic or an instinctual thing. Um, we're accountable to God. We're free agents. We're not robots. Uh, so, <laughs> what is the real cause then? What causes anger? Well, according to God, it's, it's the heart. It's your heart. It's my heart. That's, that's where the cause of anger lies. Um, Jesus said, that, uh, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. Not what hits him, but what comes out. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sex and then he lists a whole bunch of them. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. From the, it's from the heart. Um, he also said, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I mean, how could he make it any more clear? And the fact that of that first scripture I read, he didn't list anger in those evil thoughts. Clearly, anger, unrighteous anger, is an evil thought. I don't, I don't have any problem putting it in that list. I don't think he was trying to exhaustively list all the evil thoughts. Um, and this, and this, they both say the same thing. My, what I say, what I do, it comes out of my heart. The evil that comes out of my life, any evil you see, it comes out of my heart. Um, okay, so what is the heart? <laughs> um, uh, the, the book that we're looking at, this uprooting anger book, he has a good sentence that I'll just read. It's the most frequent biblical term for a person's entire inner self, an all-encompassing term that includes our thoughts, will, affections, and emotions. I, it's, whatever, it's, it's whatever's driving the bus, okay? That's, that's the heart. Whatever decides where the bus is going, that's my heart. Um, 
and I don't know if it's helpful to define it too specifically because it's not used real specifically in the Bible, but it's, it's essentially what makes me who I am, why I do the things I do, uh, what, what causes me to do the things I do. My thoughts, the decisions I make, my will, what I set my heart on, my affections, and my emotions, what, uh, my emotional life, how far I let that go. Um, in, in Hebrews 4.12, it's interesting because it talks about our heart and it, it lists, again, not necessarily meaning to be exhaustive probably, but it lists two primary things that the heart does. And it's an interesting verse because of that. Um, I think it's significant. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and, in, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart the thoughts and intents of the heart. So putting this together, here's what I get. My anger, my sinful anger, not righteous anger, but my, my sinful anger that I would like to get rid of, it comes from my heart. And, and another way of saying that is it comes from the sinful thoughts or beliefs I have in my heart and my intents or my motives that are in my heart. It's what I think and it's what motivates me. That's where my anger comes from. My thoughts my, or my beliefs and the motives that I cling to in my heart. Um, it's, <laughs> it's no wonder that Proverbs tells us, Proverbs chapter 4, uh, verse 23, um, it says, above all else, guard your heart because it is the wellspring of life. Everything comes out of your heart. Your thoughts, your intents, they, they come out of your heart. The good, the bad, and the ugly, it comes out of your heart. And so I need to guard that because that's what my life, what my life looks like. It springs out of my heart. That's the source of, you know, you, you follow a, a river and you follow it to its source and somewhere up there there's a, a source, whether it's from a glacier or from an underground spring or whatever, that's the source. That's where everything comes from eventually. And that's, that's the same thing in my life. The source of it is my heart. If I'm going to uproot anger from my life, what I have to do then is I've got to recognize what those sinful, sinful beliefs are that I'm hanging on to and what are my sinful motives that I'm hanging on to I've got to recognize what those things are and I've got to uproot them and I've got to it's the old replacement principle we talk about a lot I can't just pull them out I got to I got to put something in their place I have to replace them with right thoughts and and right motives Um, the thoughts and motives of Christ that I find in his word and that's why we need the word one of the reasons we need the word so much Um, there's an example of this in this book I I, want to read it's actually he's He's quoting it from another book um, uh, written by an amazing guy who I've talked about before. I won't talk about now, but Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, one of the, uh, when the Soviet Union fell, finally fell, um, there's three people that a lot of people uh, gave responsibility for that, for the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, One was um, Pope John Paul, and the other was Ronald Reagan, and the third one was Alexander Solzhenitsyn for the things that he wrote about what was happening in Russia and how his writings affected the opinion of people in the West. Anyway, he wrote a book called One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Um, in this book, uh, the Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn pictured this truth, uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about, um, in, a, in a powerful prison scene, the idea of replacing the, the sinful th- uh, thoughts and, and motives of our heart with, with Christ's thoughts and motives. The title character... Um, Ivan Denisovich, the title character, he questions how his fellow prisoner, Alyosha, who is a Christian, can cling to a God who leaves him in prison hungry. Ivan challenges his Christian friend to ask God to provide food. Alyosha's response stuns the skeptics. Instead of asking God for food, Alyosha tells Ivan that they must pray that the Lord Jesus should remove the scum of anger from our hearts. I mean, that cuts right to the chase, doesn't it? Really? Um, that, that's what Jesus would do. He focuses on the eternal. He focuses on the important, not what's going on, you know, necessarily right now this second. Um, I, <laughs> I would like my response to the curveballs that life throws at me to be a lot more like Alyosha's, um, where it demonstrates an awareness that there is a God, he's real, and he wants to do something um, uh, in whatever situation I'm in, he wants to do something. It may be something inside me. It may be something for somebody else's benefit. It may be both. And, and see, this is what I forget. When I get angry, I forget this. I, I forget that Jesus is with me. 
I forget that he wants to do something and my anger makes it look like, because that's how I'm thinking at the moment, I'm the only one that's involved in this picture. This is all about me, um, how it's affecting me, and I lose my chance to glorify God. I lose it. I just throw it away like Esau threw away his birthright because I've made it all about me and I've completely put blinders on my eyes to the big picture that there's a God who's at work here and that's what happens when I get angry. I've made it all about me. Um, okay, so <laughs> that's great, Tad, but how do, I, how do I identify what these sinful thoughts and what these sinful you know, beliefs and, and motives I'm holding on to in my heart, how do I identify what they are? How do I know what they are? Um, well, Brother James gets right to the point on this. Um, and we've spent some time in this verse uh, when John was going through the peacemaker stuff. We, we talked about this. But hey, can't talk about it too much. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people. And then he goes on and says some more nice things to them. Um, now, by the way, you, you might be thinking, okay, that's great, Ted, but he never mentions anger there. Why are you using this verse to talk about anger when the verse doesn't mention anger? Well, first of all, <laughs> fights and quarrels pretty much always involve anger. Um, moreover, though, he's talking about killing. Um, now, I am not aware of any evidence that there was an epidemic of actual murders breaking out in the early church uh, that James was writing about. Um, so because I have no evidence of that, I, I conclude he must be referring to what Jesus talked about in Matthew 5, where he said, if you have this unjustified anger towards your brother, it's essentially like killing him. Um, you've, you've essentially murdered him in your heart. Um, and so I think James does have anger in mind here uh, be, because of that. So. I look at that passage and there's some observations that I, I, I see. There's some things that I see in that passage. First, the, the first thing I see in this description here is that, okay, pretty clearly there's a war going on inside of me. Um, he points to my desires that battle within me. Uh, Peter said the same thing. Peter, um, Peter talked about just the desires that wage war against your soul. In 1 Peter 2, he talks about that. Um, it's the old battle of the flesh against the spirit that you know we're <laughs> all too familiar with. Um, the second thing, though, is, okay, these desires are doing battle, but they grow to the point where they can begin to rule me. Um, look what he says. You covet. Um, I, I covet. I can't be satisfied unless I get that thing that, that I want. Um, I kill my brother. I become so angry that Jesus says I'm in danger of judgment because essentially I've killed my brother in my heart. Um, because of the, the anger that I have for my brother. Um, does this sound familiar? <laughs> it should, because John laid this out a few weeks ago when we talked about uh, from the, the peacemaker stuff and talking about relationships. Um, we, we have this progression um, of how a desire can progress and become an actual heart idol. Um, uh, it, you know, it starts with a desire. Okay, I want something. That, that's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with, well, some wants are bad, but a lot of them, it's fine. I desire something. But then, if I don't get what I desire, then it changes and it gets a little more intense. And I say, okay, not only do I desire, not only would it be nice to have it, I have to have it. I demand it. Um, give it to me now, or I will not be happy. I will not be fulfilled. Okay, now I'm starting to get into trouble. And the problem is, he says, you don't ask God. The reason you don't get it is because you don't ask God. You're, you're asking each other. You're demanding it from other people. But people are really, really little, okay? God is really, really big. And we're asking these really, really little people to give us something that only a really, really big God can actually give us. And so we don't get it because they can't give it to us. And so what was the next step we do? We start to judge them. We start to say, how dare you? How dare you not give that to me, you dirty, rotten scoundrel? Um, but that's not enough, it's just to label them. The next thing we do is we actually start to punish them. Um, you know, the old saying, idols demand sacrifices. And so we start to punish. And probably one of the best, not best, but one of the most common ways we punish people is anger, is with our anger. Now that can come out in different ways. It can be a big explosion and a blow up. It can be just the iciest cold shoulder you've ever seen. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different ways we can express that. But that's what happens. And, uh, and, and I, that's what I see as, as he's starting to describe the effect that these desires can have. Um, 
And then, and then the other thing I see, and I've already alluded to it, is the, these, um, these desires that fight to rule within me, they don't necessarily have to start out as bad desires, as evil desires. Um, I would say, I guess thankfully in a way, in my life, usually they don't. I, I, I mean, <laughs> a, a lot of times we, we can and, and, we, and we often do start out desiring something that God forbids or that's just, just not good for, for anybody. And that will obviously war against the spirit. Um, but by the time you've been a Christian for a while, it's, you know, it's kind of automatic. I mean, a lot of times you know, okay, that's not something the Lord wants for me. I actually don't want to, whatever, go out and um, steal my neighbor's really cool lawnmower that works way better than mine. Um, I know that that's something he's forbidden. Um, but James isn't just talking about evil desires. His, uh, his insight goes way beyond that. Um, even if the thing desired is good, that desire can start to war against, uh, uh, against the spirit. How would that happen? Well, it, it happens b- when this progression starts to happen, where it goes from just a desire to a demand, when I, when I really have to have it. In other words, the desire just grows, it becomes inordinate. It's out of proportion to what it should be. My neighbor actually has a nice lawnmower. <laughs> um, he actually let me borrow it a couple times because I threw a rod in mine and I had to rebuild the engine and it took me about a week and so the grass didn't stop growing. And so he let me borrow it and it was so nice to use his lawnmower. It was just like, just these little, one pedal, just push, not push, push, not push. And it was just, it was wonderful. <laughs> and it didn't clog up and it ran so much faster than mine did. And it was just beautiful. And I... I felt the beginnings of a stirring of a covetous desire growing within me <laughs> to have this lawnmower. Um, but I knew it wasn't for me. Uh, God has decided to punish me with machines that don't work very well. Um, that's just, that's my cross that I bear in life. <laughs> that and migraines. So I'll take that. It could be worse. Um, anyway, it's possible to desire a good thing too much and let it, and let it get out of, out of proportion. So in other words, it's not so much what I want, but it's how much I want it that can be the problem. Now, he doesn't lay all that out very clearly here. Why do I think that's what he's saying? Here's why. Because in verse 2, look what he says. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but can't get, so you quarrel and fight. You don't have because you don't ask God. Okay, he's holding out the possibility that if you did ask God, he would give it to you. So he can't be talking about evil desires here. He must be talking about desires that actually aren't terrible. That if we would ask God, he would give it to us. But we don't ask him. We start to covet. We start to kill for it. And things get out of control. And then when we finally do, if we ever do ask God, then he doesn't give it to us because it's become ah, selfish desires and and it's it's been twisted all out of proportion. So um, he seems to be contemplating things that initially, if I would have asked God, he might have given it to me. Um, the, uh, so, so what happens is these things get twisted and they actually become functional idols. Why do I say that? Because look at what verse 4 says, you adulterous people. He calls them adulterers. Now, is he suddenly changing subjects and talking about sex here? No, he's not. It's the same flow. He's calling them adulterers because that's what they are. And in the Old Testament, Israel got called adulterous people all the time by God because they left him, their husband in a sense, and they went after false gods and worshiped false gods. Spiritual adultery was one of their biggest things that they did. And that's exactly what he's saying here. You guys have become adulterers because you've gone after a false god. You have replaced God on the throne of your affections. You've pushed him off and you've put something else there. That's why he's not going to give you what you want because it'll destroy you. It'll make you forget all about him. And he knows how bad that would be, not for him, but for you. I mean, for him, because he loves you, but for you especially. Um, so these things are actual functional idols in our lives. Um, so that's, that's where anger begins in the heart, and, that's, and that kind of dis- describes how this happens, how, um, how our desires are, are, are responsible for that when we let them get out of control. Um, <laughs> and we know this. We've been afflicted with this problem for a long time. In fact, that's part of the problem. It's a lifelong problem. It started when? It started, well, look what David said. Surely I have been a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Um, And this is that fallen nature that we talk about, uh, that we've been corrupted. Um, Augustine, St. Augustine, he understood this. Um, uh, He wrote a thing called the Confessions of St. Augustine. It's a real famous work that's 
actually well worth reading with other people. You can talk about it. Um, Anyway, in, in part of that, he wrote about his early childhood in, in part of that book and how God had graciously provided for him through his mother and through this nursemaid that was with their family. And, um, and, and he wrote, let's see, uh, I, think, I think I might have time to do this. Um, I'm just going to read what he wrote. Uh, let's... No, I'm not. I'll summarize it. <laughs> he talks about when he was a baby, um, you know, he, he would first, the first thing he learned is just how to eat, you know, um, just, he, he would, he says, I, I knew only how to suck, to repose in what pleased, to cry at what offended my flesh, nothing more. And then he began to smile, and he would make these little movements, um, but uh, he doesn't remember it, but everything, he's saying, everything revolved around me and, and what I wanted. Um, little by little, I became conscious of where I was and began to express my wishes, my wishes to those who would content them. Um, and when I was not immediately obeyed, my wishes being harmful to me or unintelligible, in other words, when people didn't understand what he wanted or if they didn't give it to him right now, um, he says, then I was indignant with my elders for not submitting to me, <laughs> with those owing me no service for not serving me and avenged myself on them by tears. And that's what babies do, right? I mean, we, we, his point is, he goes on, he says, you know, we say babies are innocent. Babies are these innocent little things. And he says, are you kidding me? He says, here's what I was when I was a baby. If you didn't give me what I wanted right now, I would get even with you by crying all night and keeping you up. Not that my kids have ever done that. <laughs> my, a lot of, some of you know my kids, and I love my kids. They're great kids, and Betsy, our oldest, is a great kid. But I will never forgive her for the night of my brother's wedding because we drove all the way to Nampa, Idaho, and she was a great traveler. And something, she was a baby. She was probably not even one maybe at the time. And we got to the hotel and she just started to scream. And we're like, okay, something must be wrong. We're looking for some sign of nothing. She just, you know that cry that babies make sometimes? It's pain. But then there's the angry cry. This was the angry cry. And we're like, what? What? You know, like Idaho? You don't even know where we are. What? How can... <laughs> And she kept crying. I had to take her out of the hotel finally because I was, we were everybody, she was keeping everybody up on either side of us. And I drove for almost an hour and she didn't stop crying. I just drove. I just hit the freeway and I drove. And I, th and I just thought, I'm just going to drive until she shuts up. And it was almost an hour. And she finally stopped crying. And then I turned around and I drove back to the hotel and got two hours of sleep that night. So, but, so anyway, that's what babies do. Um, he said, don't tell me that they're innocent. This is what he says. Um, th this is a great line. He says, the weakness then, b because he's saying, they, they scream, they cry, they flail their arms about. And if, if, he said, if I could, I would, I'm paraphrasing, but if I could, I would have leveled you with one punch if you didn't give me what I wanted. But I couldn't because I was a baby. And he says, it is the weakness then of an infant's limbs, not its will. That is its innocence. It's innocent because it can't lay you out with one punch. That's why we say babies are innocent, because they're so harmless. They're just... But they can't do anything. They can't walk. They just lay there. And he, he goes on and he points out all the different ways that the very young can be selfish and jealous and filled with all kinds of iniquity when their desires aren't met. I've had six, so I totally know what he's talking about. And, and he says, but we tolerate this. We say, oh, it's just they're just immature. It's just infant immaturity. Why? Because we trust that they'll grow up and they'll learn to control their desires, and they'll control their outbursts of jealousy and their outbursts of wrath, and they'll get it together. He, he says, we bear gently with all this, not as being no or even slight evils, but because they will disappear as years increase. For though tolerated now, the very same tempers are utterly intolerable when found in riper years. But here's the thing. How sad is it when you look around, maybe in the mirror, maybe at people you know, and you see that we don't always grow up and learn to control our desires, do we? Or our wrath. And the problem is, now our limbs are stronger. Our words are stronger. And we have the capacity to hurt and to lash out and do harm now that babies didn't. And it is intolerable. Um, it's, it's ugly. And it, it, it ought never be. Um, so the question of the hour is this. Do I rule my desire or does my desire rule me? Do you rule your desires, or do your desires rule you? Um, how can I tell? How do I know? Um, 
Well, if the desire is for something that God forbids, obviously it's pretty easy. It's not that tough. If I'm pursuing it against his expressed wishes, then I pretty clearly pushed him off the throne and I'm doing something entirely different. But what if it's not? Especially if it's a, what if it's even a good desire? Something that in, you look in the word and it's, it, it's a good thing. It's recommended by God. How, how do I know when it's become too much? Um, when, it's, when it's inordinate? What are the indicators that a good desire has become a bad master? I guess that's a good way to put it. That's how he puts it in the book. Um, there are some indicators. And here's the first clue. Um, first clue is when it begins to consume me. And what I mean by that is that it takes up way too much of my time, my thoughts, my energy. I'm just, I'm dwelling on it. Um, questions that, you know, I can ask myself. When my mind is not directed on something, which for me is actually not very often, um, but when it's not, where do my thoughts go? When I just have just downtime, nothing expected of me, I'm not working on anything, where does my mind go? Um, if I do have uh, even directed downtime, where, okay, I'm not going to do anything here, I'm just going to relax, where does my mind go in those times? Um, and that's, that's a, good, a good indicator. What does that have to do with anger? Well, here's what it has to do with anger. When we begin to be consumed by something, um, we kind of lose perspective. And we start that journey from I desire to I demand. And if you don't give me what I want, I judge, and I'm even going to punish you uh, with anger, probably, in some form. I I'm going to give you an example from my life. <laughs> um, personal example. And I asked her if I could share this, and she goes, oh, that's fine. And it wasn't Kay. It was one of my girls. It was Heidi, um, who uh, I had the pleasure of coaching for four years during high school. I coached her in jumps and hurdles. Um, and, and another guy coached her in jumps for a while in the last couple of years. But, um, uh, <laughs> and I had, my desires were her, were, for, for her were good. I wanted her to do well. Um, I wanted her to get a scholarship because <laughs> we couldn't afford to send her to probably a real nice Christian college. Um, but I also wanted her to do well just to bring glory to God through her abilities and how she responded. Because Heidi, she's, she's pretty humble. Um, and I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity uh, for, for her to do well. And uh, the thing is, I mean, I'm not trying to brag. I'm, I have to say this for the story to make sense. She's really good. She's really good. And she did wind up getting a scholarship. Um, but I spent, it, it, it consumed me, or it fought to consume me. I should say, I knew it was happening, I, I, and I fought against it. But I never, I, I never could, I never achieved victory. I, I had to constantly fight. Um, it was like a guerrilla warfare just going on all the time. It would just raise its head, and I'd try to kill it, then over here and over here. And I would, I, I would, uh, I mean, I was her coach, right? So I had to do things, but I would, on the hurdles, I would chart every, every uh, step that she took in the race, how long, how short. I would take splits from one hurdle to the next. You know, oh, that was a 1.25 second split. That's great. Ooh, this one was 1.31. That's too slow. You know, I mean, I was just a fanatic about it. <laughs> we have a unique relationship, Heidi and I, and, and if she didn't do well, it would frustrate me. And I would say things jokingly, and she knew it was joking, but yet there was a point to it. I'd say, well, today you kind of ran like a pregnant manatee. And, and she was like, okay, Dad, tell me what you really think. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, I would go, they have this thing online where you can look at what all the people all through the state are doing, and I would compare you know, you know, if she had a good, you know, got some good times, I would compare, well, how, how did that move her up or whatever? And I just spent way too much time and energy on this. And I knew it and I would, I would fast from it. I would not go on, online to check after every meet. I would say, no, I'm not going to check. And I just was fighting it all the time. But here's the thing. It, it affected my joy. Um, and this is how, this is why it was a problem. Because if she did below expectations, I would get frustrated or, in other words, angry. Um, now, not blow your top angry, but I was frustrated, and I had no joy uh, if, if she would perform below expectations. I knew it. I fought it. I didn't want it to affect her, so <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit this, but what I did is I just developed this habit that after a race, I would not go down to talk to her until two or three minutes had passed, and I, I, because I didn't want to go down if I was frustrated, and I didn't want her to pick that up. But I didn't want to just rush down when she did well because I didn't want her to think, oh, dad loves me when I do well, but when I do good, he doesn't show up for 10 minutes. <laughs> I didn't want her to think that either. So I just, I just made it this routine that I would wait two or three minutes and then I would go to her after a race, good or bad, didn't matter. 
But I needed that two or three minutes just to remind myself to focus on and be content with the fact that, you know what? Heidi has a really good heart. And however she performed in this meet, that has nothing to do with her heart and the fact that she's our daughter and that we love her. And I, I needed that two minutes just to remind myself of that, um, good or bad. Because the temptation was... Uh, her senior year, she they have this huge meet here in Olympia. All the Olympia schools, the real big ones, Shelton, Centralia, Chehalis, Aberdeen, Yelm, um, they all come to this meet. And then there's little tiny Northwest Christian. And she got the athlete of the meet for like three years at that meet. And her senior year, she tied a 30-year record in the hurdles, which is just a big deal. And I was so happy. But I, I, it was just like, I'm still going to wait. I'm still going to wait because she's just our daughter. And and I just, I, but, but, but this was just, you know, I was really, really happy. And then I'm, I'm telling you that to tell you this, that 30-year record just is a big deal. And then so what happens? The girl she beat last year, this year, beat that record <laughs> one year later. <laughs> so it's like, okay, Ted, that's what you get <laughs> for, you know, taking. Anyway, it was a struggle, uh, and, and I knew it, and so I just, I had to keep fighting and keep fighting. And, this, and the key was this, it was consuming my time and my emotional energy, and I knew that. And we all have things that do that, I suspect. Another clue is this. A good desire um, becomes inordinate when you're willing to sin to get it. Okay, real bad sign there. Um, uh, questions you can ask yourself. What have I been willing to do to get this desire met? Whom have I hurt? What sinful strategies have I employed to get it? Uh, the cold shoulder, manipulation, belittling people, shaming people, uh, intimidation or fear. Have I lied? Anger? What have I done? Have I sinned to get this thing that's really important to me? Um, there's a thing I want to read from in, in here. Uh, no, I don't. I'm, I don't have time. Um, so, anyway... And then the third thing, and, and maybe this is the, <laughs> probably is, this is the most common, sadly. Um, so does it spend too much time? Is it consuming you? Are you willing to sin to get it? The third thing is, are you willing to sin when you don't get it? And that's what happens way too often in our kitchens and living rooms and bedrooms um, at home. We don't get something we want. We're not getting something we want, and we sin because we're not getting it. Um, how do you respond? How do I respond when God sovereignly, because he's God, everything he does is sovereign. How do I respond when God sovereignly withholds my heart desire? Or when I have these felt needs that go unmet? At the end, uh, up here on the table, there's a sheet and one of the, that, that I give people sometimes. It's like a worksheet. And one of them, it's just a couple pages, but one of them is felt needs that are common that we feel, things that we want that go unmet that can lead to this kind of thing. And it's a helpful list to just go down and check yourself with. Am I, ooh, ooh, now that I think about it, this one kind of strikes pretty close to home. So I recommend that you pick that up. There's only about 40 of them, so one per family. Um, so, uh, how do I respond when, when God withholds that from me? Do I respond with godly contentment? Like Paul, I've learned in all circumstances to be content. Or do I respond with anger or depression or fear or whatever? Um, so, where do you struggle with this? Where do you see these indicators? I'll tell you where I see them. I've already told you. It's in my family. Um, that's where I see it all the time. Um, uh, it, uh, it, it starts right there. And, and it, typically it'll start off with a good desire, but that, that desire becomes way too important. And I know it does because these indicators, what, what I do, I start responding to people in unchristlike ways. That's, that's one thing I do. And I forget that God may be seeing a bigger picture than I am. I forget that. Um, uh, you know, I, I want my children to obey me, right? To, to heed my wisdom and, and to live a life that glorifies Jesus as Lord. That's a great desire. But instead, I start to see him or her as a tool that I can use to show what a great parent I am, um, which is twisting it. And I forget, here's what I forget. I forget that our biggest failures, including my kids, are oftentimes the very thing that draws us to Jesus and shows us how much we need Jesus. And that's really the overriding desire I have in my life for my kids, is that they would see how much they need Jesus. And so um, I forget that failure can be, the, that's the failure in a couple areas has been, at least with two of my kids, big time failure is what drew them to the cross. And yet when they fail, I get frustrated. Well, maybe that's God's grace pulling them to the cross, and here I am resisting that. Um, I, <coughs> I want my wife to honor and respect me 
So what do I do? I start treating it as my very most important project to get her to do it. And what do I forget? I forget that God, yeah, that's something God wants, but he told her to do it. He didn't tell me to make sure she does it. Okay? Big, big difference. And I just, I forget that. Or maybe, you know, you wives, you want your husband um, to love you with at least something resembling Christ's love for the church. So you treat that like your biggest project. And what do you forget? You forget the same thing that I just told the husbands. You forget God told him to do that. He didn't tell you to make sure he does that. And so you just completely lose perspective. Um, not that this has ever happened with Kay and I, but I, you know, I might want us to be thrifty stewards of our financial resources, not wasteful like my spouse would have us to be. Um, now, actually, Kay is not wasteful at all, but there was this one category that I thought she was very wasteful in, that I thought was ridiculous that she wanted to spend so much money in, and that was this stupid category of gifts. Gifts. If you want to tell somebody, give somebody a gift, then make a homemade card and send it to them. They'll probably like it better. Why are you buying this woman that you went to high school with a $30 gift? I didn't understand. Um, waste of money. So what do I do? I start to accuse and condemn, which is a lot more like who than Christ. <laughs> it's a lot more like Satan than Christ. Um, and I forget that God might have just put generosity in my helpmate to help balance the frugality that he put in me. Maybe it cuts the other way with you. Maybe you want, your, you, want uh, you to be generous stewards of your resources instead of the miserly way that your spouse would approach it. So what do you do? Um, you start to accuse and condemn, which is a lot more like Satan than Christ. And maybe, just maybe, what you forget is that God might have put some frugality in your helpmate to help balance the generosity that you have, um, that he put in you. Uh, maybe that's why he calls them helpmates. Um, or, you know, whatever. I want you to do this thing my way because my way is clearly the best way. Um, okay, that's probably just hubris. But, uh, you know, here's the thing. Even if my way is the best way, which I honestly believe usually it is. Um, but here's the thing I've had to learn. There's uh, usually more than one way to skin a cat. And the argument that we're having right now is pretty much uh, negating the bestness of my way. Um, so I may be winning the battle, but I'm losing the war. Um, there's a... Uh, how many of you have read The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis? Probably not very many. A few? Dang, okay. I, I don't have time to read it. I'm not going to read it. It's so good, though. If you have the book, um, read uh, chapter 11, um, because there's a discussion between... Um, the, the premise is, is the author of the book, he comes up to heaven on a bus with other people from hell, and they're all ghosts. They're like shadows. Um, they're not substantial. They're ghostly. And these people from heaven come down to talk to them, people they knew in life. And the people from heaven are bright, and they're substantial, and they're real. And, and there's a conversation between a ghost from hell who's a mother, and she's talking to her brother. And she really wants to talk to her son, and she has loved her son. And you can see in this conversation, it's so good, how even something as wonderful as a mother's love can be corrupted and twisted into an ugly, demonic idol. And you would never think that was possible, but he does such a good job. And in the conversation, he makes a lot of the points that I'm talking about today. And it's so worth the read, but I, it, it, it would, I timed it. It would take me like seven minutes to read it, and I have like two minutes left, so I'm, I'm not going to do it. Um, uh, temptation. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. Um, okay, uh, the, the last, what's that? Well, it is, it is good. Um, okay, where's John? John? John's not here. Okay, I'm going to read it. And, I, and, and I'll skip the end. The, the end, actually, can you put up the last slide uh, for the end? The, it's biblical snapshots. Just go ahead and flip them all down there. Um, and these are, we all know these stories, Esau, Balak, Saul, Herod. These are all people that just blew their top because they had desires that weren't met. And they were looking to people to do it. Um, Saul looked to David. Balak looked to Balaam. Esau um, looked to his, his father to give him the blessing. Um, Herod, you know, whoa, what are you talking about, a new king? So he kills all the, all the babies. Um, just where anger got the upper hand. <coughs> okay, I'm going to read this. So... This is the guy coming up from hell. Um, one of the most painful meetings we witnessed was between a woman's ghost and a bright spirit who had apparently been her brother. 
They must have met only a moment before we ran across them, for the ghost was just saying in a tone of unconcealed disappointment, Oh, Reginald, it's you, is it? Yes, dear, said the spirit. I know you expected someone else. Can you, I I hope you can be a little glad to see even me for the present. I did think Michael would have come, said the ghost, and then almost fiercely, he is here, of course. He's there, far up in the mountains. Why hasn't he come to meet me? Didn't he know? My dear, don't worry, it will all come right presently. It wouldn't have done, not yet. He wouldn't be able to merely, oops, skip the page here. He wouldn't have been able to see or hear you as you are at present. You'd be totally invisible to Michael, but we'll soon build you up. She'll get more substantial if she stays there. Well, I should have thought, if you can see me, my own son could. It doesn't always happen like that. You see, I have specialized in this sort of work. Oh, it's work, is it? Snapped the ghost. Then after a pause, well, when am I going to be allowed to see him? There's no question of being allowed, Pam. As soon as it's possible for him to see you, of course he will. You need to be thickened up a bit. How, said the ghost. The monosyllable was hard and a little threatening. I'm afraid the first step is a hard one, said the spirit. But after that, you'll go on like a house on fire. You'll become solid enough for Michael to perceive you when you learn to want someone else besides Michael. I don't say more than Michael, not as a beginning. That will come later. It's only the little germ of a desire for God that we need to start the process. Oh, you mean religion and all that sort of thing. This is hardly the moment. And from you, of all people. Well, never mind. I'll do whatever's necessary. What do you want me to do? Come on. The sooner I begin it, the sooner they'll let me see my boy. I'm quite ready. But Pam, do you <laughs> do think, don't you see, you're not beginning at all as long as you're in that state of mind. You're treating God only as a means to Michael. But the whole thickening treatment consists in learning to want God for his own sake. You wouldn't talk like that if you were a mother. You mean if I were only a mother. But there's no such thing as being only a mother. You exist as Michael's mother only because you first exist as God's creature. That relation is older and closer. No, listen, Pam, he also loves. He also has suffered. He also has waited a long time. If he loved me, he'd let me see my boy. If he loved me, why did he take Michael away from me? I wasn't going to say anything about that, but it's pretty hard to forgive, you know. But he had to take Michael away, partly for Michael's sake. I'm sure I did my best to make Michael happy. I gave up my whole life. Human beings can't make one another really happy for long, Pam. And secondly, for your sake. He wanted your merely instinctive love for your child. Tigresses share that, you know, to turn into something better. He wanted you to love Michael as he understands love. You cannot love a fellow creature fully until you love God. Sometimes this conversion can be done while the instinctive love is still gratified, but there was, it seems, no chance of that in your case. The instinct was uncontrolled and fierce and monomaniac. Ask your daughter or your husband. Ask your own mother. You haven't thought once of her. The only remedy was to take away its object. It was a case for surgery. When that first kind of love was thwarted, then there was just a chance that in the loneliness, in the silence, something else might begin to grow. This is all nonsense, cruel and wicked nonsense. What right have you to say things like that about mother love? It's the highest and holiest feeling in human nature. Pam, no natural feelings are high or low, holy or unholy in themselves. They're all holy when God's hand is on the rein. They all go bad when they set up on their own and make themselves into false gods. My love for Michael would never have gone bad, not if we'd lived together for millions of years. You are mistaken, and you must know. Haven't you met down there mothers who have their sons with them in hell? Does their love make them happy? If you mean people like the Guthrie woman and her dreadful Bobby, of course not. I hope you're not suggesting... If I had Michael, I'd be perfectly happy, even in that town. I wouldn't always be talking about him until everyone hated the sound of his name, which is what Winifred Guthrie does about her brat. I wouldn't quarrel with people for not taking enough notice of him and then be furiously jealous if they did. I wouldn't go about whining and complaining that he wasn't nice to me, because, of course, he would be nice. Don't you dare to suggest that Michael would ever become like the Guthrie boy. There are some things I won't stand. What you've seen in the Guthries is what natural affection turns to in the end, if it will not be converted. It's a lie, a wicked, cruel lie. How could anyone love their son more than I did? Haven't I lived only for his memory all these years? That was rather a mistake, Pam. In your heart of hearts, you know it was. What was a mistake? All that ten years ritual of grief. 
keeping his room exactly as he'd left it, keeping anniversaries, refusing to leave the house, though Dick and Muriel were both wretched there. Of course they didn't care. I know that. I soon learned to expect no real sympathy from them. You're wrong. No man ever felt his son's death more than Dick. Not many girls loved their brothers better than Muriel. It wasn't against Michael they revolted. It was against you, against having their whole life dominated by the tyranny of the past, and not really even Michael's past, but your past. You are heartless. Everyone is heartless. The past was all I had. It was all you chose to have. It was the wrong way to deal with a sorrow. It was Egyptian, like embalming a dead body. Oh, of course I'm wrong. Everything I say or do is wrong, according to you. But of course, said the spirit, shining with love and mirth, so that my eyes were dazzled. That's what we all find when we reach this country. We've all been wrong. That's the great joke. There's no need to go on pretending one was right. After that, we begin living. And there's more, but I'll stop there. Much better way to end than reading C.S. Lewis in my notes. Um, so... The point is simply this, of James 4, these examples. Anger rises up when we don't get what we desperately want. And our desires for evil things or even out of control, inordinate desires for good things, that's what underlies our anger. Those are the heart roots of our weeds of anger. They're the blackberry vines of our anger, if you will. And so the thing to do is identify what they are and then pull them out. And next week, we're going to talk about pulling them out through repentance uh, today I've mostly talked about trying to identify what they are. I encourage you to come up and grab one of these because there's some help there. There's some questions and exercise you can go through that just kind of help you identify what those desires are that are threatening to rule, that are behind a lot of your anger. Um, it's something I give for homework sometimes uh, when, when I meet with people, and it's just good to go over and just to go over and look. So I encourage you to do that. Um, so uh, that is all I have. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you never give up. And we thank you that uh, when we finally come to the point where <laughs> we realize we have been wrong in so many ways, that's when we begin to live because that's when we yield to you and that's when we fall into you. And I just pray, God, with respect to these things we've talked about, that we would fall into you, um, that you would reveal to us what our desires are that are becoming inordinate, that are, are taking, uh, taking up precious space on the throne of our heart, the throne of our affections, that should only be occupied by you. So would you please give us grace to see what they are and then grace to, to turn from them and replace them with worship of the true God. Um, thank you for tonight. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for being with us. Um, may our lives be expressions of gratitude to you and bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.